All right. Well, good to be with you guys. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, good morning. Merry Christmas. This is our last Sunday before uh, Christmas, and so I can't believe it's Christmas week already, which means that 2020 is almost over. Praise the Lord. So that'll be good. A couple things to draw your attention to here um, as we get started. Um, number one, you've got some Connect cards in the back of the seat in front of you, and if you are new with us, we just wanted to say welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I am Pastor Ryan. Uh, Pastor Jeremy is our lead pastor, and so we encourage you to please come meet us, come find us uh, after service or uh, at some point, and we would love to meet you and get to know you. Uh, you can also throw your info down, down on that uh, that Connect card. Um, you can fill that out and then drop it in the offering plate as it comes by, or if you want any information about anything, or if you are ready to take a, the next step and begin serving, you can check a box to get some info about serving on the back of that card as well. And so um, we believe in what, whatever, whatever your next step is 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 something that the Lord might be leading you to. And so whether that is serving, maybe it's joining a community group, maybe it's getting baptized, uh, maybe it's giving your heart to the Lord uh, for the first time if you don't know him. And so be asking the Lord during this service, what is my next step? And we would love to partner with you in taking that next step as we uh, pursue Jesus together today. So, all right. So uh, next up, we are going to take our offering. I'm going to invite the ushers forward and take our offering together. Um, and uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, it says this. It says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. And so as we um, celebrate Christmas this season, as we celebrate this, this Advent season, um, this is what we celebrate. Not just the fact that Jesus came. Jesus could have come as a conquering king, and he will come as a conquering king at his second Advent. But during his first Advent, it says that he became poor. The one who literally owns everything gave up everything for us. And so out of response to that, we give to him. And that's what this offering is all about. And so, so two things that this offering is. Number one, uh, this offering is worship. This is a way to say thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you to the one who became poor so for our sakes we might become rich. And then secondly, it's a way to say that, that um, all of the, the treasure that we have is ultimately in Christ. He is our greatest treasure. None of the earthly riches that we so often cling to or hold on to, none of those things have any sway because Jesus is our greatest treasure. So even if we lose all of those things, we have lost nothing in light of eternity because Christ became poor so that you might become rich. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this reality. Thank you for this truth. I pray that uh, we would give out of this heart, Lord, this heart of thankfulness um, and this heart that says, God, you own everything, and this is an expression of that as we give to you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, as those plates are going around, we're looking forward to our Christmas Eve service. Uh, that's going to be coming up, and I'm pretty sure Christmas Eve is on December 24th this year. Is that correct? I think I got that right. And so December 24th, we're looking forward to seeing you here. Two services at 5 and 6.30, so we encourage you to be here. And on that Saturday, next Saturday, the 26th, we will not be having our Saturday night service day after Christmas, and so we encourage you to come on Sunday. And so whatever you're doing right now on Sunday, do it again next week, okay? Don't try to come on Saturday because the doors will probably be locked. And so be here on a Sunday morning instead. All right, and the last thing to draw your attention to is uh, as you're making your way out of the service today, I encourage you to stop by. There's a, a uh, thing right back there on the wall that used to be this ugly, like mid-2000s welcome sign. And so now we've flipped that around and we've, we've sort of uh, renovated that wall a little bit and we have turned it into what we call the Radgram, the Radgram. And so that is where we are hanging some pictures and, and just uh, celebrating some different things that we've been doing through this Christmas season. So we encourage you to check that out on your way out. Uh, find some fun pictures. There's some, some pretty good ones up there. And so we encourage you to do that. All right. Well, without any further ado, I'm going to invite up Shekinah, our children's church director, and she is going to come up and lead us in the reading of God's word. Would you please stand as we read God's word together? Good morning. Okay, Micah 5, 2 through 5. But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, 
who are too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you shall come forth for me, one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel. And he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. Lord, thank you for your word, and I just pray this time would be blessed. And just anoint Jeremy's words and open our hearts to receive all you have for us. In Jesus' precious name. You may be seated. <laughs> well, we are at uh, the uh, uh, third installment of our Advent series. We've looked at, uh, we're doing four next week. We're going to be uh, closing it up. But <clears throat> we started by talking about the mystery of his coming. Then last week, Ryan preached on the manner of his rule. Next week, Dennis Fuqua is going to be preaching uh, on the majesty of his name. And today, I get the privilege of talking about the uh, miracle of his peace. Now, peace is an interesting thing. Uh, with Cre with uh, Christmas, you see uh, peace all over the place. Uh, it's it, it's one of the it's probably the most uh, uh, the word that is most as commonly associated with Christmas. It's on Christmas cards. It's in Christmas devotionals. It's on Christmas decorations, Christmas ornaments. Actually, I just last night or uh, uh, Friday night, my family uh, at night was driving through. Uh, Stevenson, and if you go into the town of Stevenson, entering from either the east or the west, there's going to be in a big light display, and it says, peace on earth, right? So peace is all around. Uh, the popular or f famous Christmas passages like we just read uh, this morning, or in, famously in Luke 2, the one that Linus quotes in Charlie Brown Christmas, you know, peace on earth, goodwill to omit towards men. It's all over the place. We're always talking about peace at Christmas. However, we're familiar with the term peace, but that we often miss the depth, the full depth of its meaning. And until we grasp the full depth of the meaning of the peace that Christ gives us or brings or comes with uh, at, in his coming at Christmas, we will, that peace will elude us and will be trapped in sort of a in seemingly endless perpetual sea of anxiety. Peace will elude us. So we're going to ask four questions to uh, unpack what is this, the, the miracle of his peace. First question is really straightforward. What is peace? What is it? Uh, we often consider peace to be the cessation of conflict, right? There's a war happening, and if the war comes to an end, what usually takes place? A peace treaty, right? And the peace treaty dictates terms that they're going to stop shooting at one another or something to that effect. And so we often think that peace is conflict going away, conflict stopping. And while that certainly is a part of peace, the Hebrew word shalom that is translated peace is far richer than just the absence uh, of conflict. And uh, actually, the Bible Project if you uh, go on YouTube and type in the Bible Project and Shalom, you'll get to enjoy a great video that unpacks the uh, meaning of this term. Uh, but what peace is all about, or Shalom, the depth of the meaning of Shalom, is it basically means to be complete or whole. Okay? So not just the cessation, cessation of conflict, but it means to be complete or whole. It refers to something that is complex and has a lot of pieces, which is in a state of completeness. You might imagine a long rock wall. We were just, my family and I were just in uh, Redmond, Oregon, and they have these, this cool rock down there, and a lot of the homes down there, or properties, have created these really big, long uh, rock walls. And it's, it's satisfying to look at one of those rock walls and have every brick just where it ought to be. A, a, a brick wall that's in a state of shalom is one that there's no gaps, there's no missing bricks. Or let me put it this way, 
This is the Empire State Building, not the real one, obviously. It's a nanoblock uh, uh, version of the Empire State Building. And nanoblocks are something that every Christmas time uh, I'll get uh, a, uh, one of these jobbies, and I'll put my family and I'll put it together like on Christmas or on New Year's Eve. I started, uh, this is the first one I ever did. And this has 200 nanoblocks in it. And this state of uh, this Empire State Building is currently in a state of shalom. Because all of the pieces are just where they ought to be. I follow the directions, and they're all together. Now, if I were to take this and throw it on the ground, it would lose its shalom, as would I, because it was a hard work putting this thing together. But <clears throat> the idea is, again, of shalom is that everything's where it ought to be. It's a state, a, a, something that's complex with lots of parts, but everything comes together, and it's whole. It's complete. And so, when you think about shalom for not just a nanoblock creation, but your life, you think about your life, your life is full of many parts, all kinds of situations, all kinds of relationships. And so, shalom is a situation where all of those complicated pieces that make up your life, everything's right, it's complete, it's whole, it's right where it ought to be. And so, the coming of peace, or the coming of shalom, again, does not simply mean putting an end to conflict, but taking what is broken and restoring it to completeness. That's the peace that we have in Christ. Now, so that's what peace is. What's our problem with peace? Second question, what is our problem with peace? Micah tells us in verse 4 here that The coming of the Messiah, or the Messiah will cause us to dwell secure, what it says, and they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. To dwell secure. Now, the Hebrew word there uh, is to, to dwell secure. What that means is literally to be able to live in a place for a long duration without having to move. That's what it means to dwell secure. You get to stay put. You're unmoved. Um, but, But here's the problem with peace. If the rubric of our understanding of peace is that everything is going to go perfectly in my life, I am sure to be frustrated and uh, at the seeming absence of this peace. We, if we're saying, okay, I can, I get you, shalom, lots of complicated parts, everything right where it ought to be, we look at our world, we look at our life, and we say, wait a second, where is this peace? There's a whole lot that's in chaos. There's a whole lot that's not where it ought to be. And it leads us, leads us to lament like Henry Wadsworth Longfellow did in his famous Christmas poem many, many years ago when he said, Um, And in despair, I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And so it's easy for us to get frustrated and go, where is this peace? Where is this shalom? But as Christians, we believe that the words of the prophet and the words of the angels who sang the song in Luke chapter 2 are true. We believe them to be true. And so if we believe those to be true, we must therefore adopt a more nuanced understanding of what this peace is that comes with the Messiah. Part of this nuanced uh, rethinking of what it means to find shalom in peace or the peace that Christ brings in his coming is to recognize that there's a couple different types of peace. Some peace is ephemeral, or that means it's, non, it's, uh, it, it, it's, not, uh, it's transitory, or it's not permanent. It doesn't last forever. It comes and it goes. Think of relational peace. Okay? Sometimes you have relational peace, and then sometimes it slips away. It might even take just one short 20-minute car ride for that peace to slip away that you once had. How many of you, have, and we have five uh, small uh, kids. We just had a few days away to spend some time in Redmond, Oregon, and there was times in that little loft that we were in where uh, it was just, there was peace. There was relational peace. Everyone was, you know, you had three kids drawing, a couple kids playing in games here. Shekinah's reading a book. I'm just taking it all in and enjoying it. And you say, man, life can't get any better. And then shortly thereafter, there's bleeding and, and screaming and things, you know. So it, 
It's ephemeral. It doesn't, it's not permanent. You experience episodes of it, but it comes and it goes. Financial peace comes and it goes. National peace, cultural peace comes and it goes. Even sometimes internal peace, just how you feel. Sometimes you're really serene and other times it goes. Moral peace, you know, moral peace meaning that, morally speaking, you're doing well. You're, 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 you're hitting the marks the way that you think you ought to be, and you feel like you're doing a good job. And sometimes that can come crashing down. And so if we are thinking that the peace that comes with the coming of Jesus in this life, right now, what you can experience right now, is a permanent and forever peace in all those areas, we're going to be frustrated. But the fact is that Jesus did not come to bring that kind of peace. He says, look, consider a couple things that he says here. Luke chapter 12. He says, do you think that I have come to give peace on earth? No, I tell you. But rather division. From now on, in one house there will be five divided, three against two, and two against three. They will be divided, father against son, and son against father, mother against daughter, and daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. He covered a lot of ground there. Then he goes on to say in Luke 21, this is talking about times to come, you know, things that are to come in the future. He says, expect this, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes and in various places, famines and pestilences, and there will be terrors and great signs from heaven. But therefore, all this they will, but before all of this, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons And you will be brought before kings and governors for my name's sake. So Jesus himself is saying, hey guys, things aren't going to be placid in every aspect of your life all the time. right? There's going to be things way outside your control. They're going to be happening all around you. Famines, pandemics, you know, governmental craziness, all kinds of stuff that's way outside of your control is going to come and have a major impact on you. He's even saying they're going to come and take you away and persecute you. It'd be very easy for the uh, disciples at that point to say, where there is no peace on earth, I said, where is this peace? But even more than that, he says, if you, because of your allegiance to Christ, because of our allegiance to Christ, that will give rise, that's what we're talking about in, in chapter 12, Luke 12 there. It will give rise to conflict with many, many people in our increasingly pagan culture. If we are aligned with Christ and the truth of what Scripture says, there's going to be conflict. There's going to be times where you have to say things that are very unpopular. There's going to ha- there be times where because of your stand for righteousness, there's going to be opposition. One of the things that's unique about culture has always been nuts, right? I mean, in the, times I've, in the time I've been alive, there's always been a way of looking at the world and the culture and go, man, that's crazy. But one thing that's kind of unique right now is they used to just kind of be crazy and do their thing. Now they're demanding that we go into that crazy or else. You know? So when, if, if that is our situation, we're going to say, where's this peace? Where's, where, where is it? Yet, there is a peace in Jesus. There is a peace in Christ that is not ephemeral, but is absolute and secure and cannot be taken away from you. So third question, where is this peace found? Where is peace found? Look at what it says in verse 5 of our passage. Very, look carefully. And he shall be their peace. The Messiah, he shall be their peace. It doesn't say that he's bringing peace. It says that he will be their peace. And his greatness is such that this peace will find its way into every corner of our life. That's what he says in verse 4. You know, and they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great. That's a, a quoted in Luke one thirty two, or mentioned also in Luke one thirty two, and talking about the coming of Christ. To the ends of the earth, his greatness is so amazing that it goes to the ends of the earth. That means that the peace that, Christ, uh, that we have in Christ will reach into every corner 
of your life and will be able to dwell, dwell secure. And what does it mean to dwell secure? Again, it means to be unmoved. That means in the midst of chaos, in the midst of crazy circumstances, in the midst of all kinds of nuttiness happening all around you, what kind of stuff? Stuff that we experience in 2020 and a whole lot worse. As bad as 2020 is, or has been, or as crazy it's been, it's nothing to what Jesus describes in chapter 21 of Luke. In the midst of that, we can be unmoved by those circumstances, unmoved by that crazy. Not something you're not impacted by it, but you can be unmoved. That is the peace we have in Christ. Now, how is it that Jesus is our peace? Remember what shalom is all about? Shalom, the coming of shalom, is taking what is broken and making it whole. This is how Jesus is our peace. He took the fractured and broken relationship that we had with the Father and made it whole. That is how Jesus is our peace. I like the way Charles Wesley put it. In his famous Christmas carol, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, where he says, Peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. Peace on earth and mercy mild. What is this peace? God and sinners reconciled. You see, our biggest problem is not crazy circumstances. Our biggest problem is needing to be reconciled with God. Now, <clears throat> this, that right there is the absolute and secure peace that we have in Jesus. The repairing of the relationship we have with God Almighty. So, last question. We'll look at this in four different parts. How do we experience that peace? How does that peace get in us and infect our reality and cause us to dwell secure? First, it starts with recognizing that humankind's primary issue is hostility with God. Hostility with God. Now, we often don't think of things in those terms. We don't look at humanity and go, man, that, their, their biggest issue, or you don't look at your own life and go, my biggest issue is hostility with God. We don't think of things in those terms. And yet, that sort of language is all throughout the New Testament. I'll give you a couple of examples. Colossians 1 Verse 21 and 22 says, And you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Jesus, in the Advent, we celebrate the fact that the word came and uh, became flesh dwelt among us. Jesus came. He was made. God became incarnate. He came and wrote himself into our story. He clothed himself in our, and clothed, him, clothed himself in our humanity. Why? To reconcile us. To put at end the hostility that we have with God. Or Romans 8, 7 says it this way, for the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. This is an interesting verse. It cannot. Now, when it says um, uh, in the flesh, that just sounds kind of gross. And it is, frankly, but not necessarily in the way you're thinking of right now. Um, What does it mean to be in the flesh? That means to operate in your own strength, in your own humanity, you know, with just the wit and the strength that you have. If you are operating in that, if that is your place of strength, if that is your security, if that is you, where, what you are operating out of, there's a hostility that you will have towards God that you are absolutely hopelessly stuck in. Because it doesn't say those who are in the flesh struggle with hostility with God. That's not what Paul says in Romans 8, 7. He says, you cannot submit to God if you're in the flesh. You cannot. It's impossible to do it. It's impossible. In the flesh, we are hopelessly stuck in hostility towards God. Now, you might be sitting there today and go, I don't know about all this. I know the Bible uses those terms, but I certainly don't feel hostile towards God. I don't remember ever feeling hostile towards God. You know why? Because the God, if the only reason that in the flesh we're not going to have a sense of hostility towards God is because we have imagined a God, we've created a God of our own imagination, and we have no problem with him. 
But when we look to the God of Scripture, or we see how God actually operates, hostility rears its ugly head. I'll give you a couple examples. People, some people, are offended by the holiness of God. Absolutely offended by the holiness of God. And this is quite common in our culture. So, for example, when you look <laughs> to the Old Testament, and you read through some of the passages like Uzzah. Now, how many of you remember Uzzah? Not an Uzi, but Uzzah. Uzzah was a guy who um, they were taking the ark back to where, where it ought to be, and it was uh, the ark of the covenant, which is where God, you know, God's manifest presence was there. It was the center of the, uh, where the Holy of Holies was in the tabernacle that we talked about a few weeks ago. This is the, the ark. Only one guy was supposed to come before the ark once a year, you know, and through all sorts of ritual and stuff went through that. And so here they're carrying it because it had been taken away. And, uh, and, and, and the ox stumble and the ark starts to fall on the ground. And so Uzzah says, I don't want the ark to touch the ground. So he reaches out to grab it so it doesn't hit the ground. And God strikes him dead. And we read that and we go, whoa, wait a second. That seems, he seemed like he was just trying to be helpful. But Uzzah made a, 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 I like what Matt Chandler says, he made a, an error. He thought that the dirt was, that he thought that he was cleaner than the dirt. He assumed, I don't want the ark to fall and touch that dirty ground, so I'll stop it. But the fact was, the dirt did not rebel against God, but humankind did. He had. And so when he touched it, God's holiness is such that he died. Or Nadab and Abihu, just recently made, consecrated as, as priests, they go, we want to bring an offering of fire before the Lord. But rather than follow all the the, 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 the strict details that he prescribed, we're just going to do it our own way. And they brought the incense, uh, that unauthorized un, uh, uh, fire before the Lord. And God didn't say, <clears throat> never do this again. No, he consumed them with fire. They died. And we go, whoa, that's intense. Or how about this? Times where God in the Old Testament says, I want you to go uh, into, into the land of Canaan, and I want you to uh, put to the sword every man, woman, and child of that, of that village or of that city. We get offended. Now, that's a complicated uh, thing to try to understand how that fits in God's whole story and stuff. Now, we're going to get into that all right now. But my point is, when we read things like that, some, there's three different responses we typically have. Either one, some people say, I, it, they'll even go so far as to say, if that's God, then I want no part of him. And I won't even believe in God. Some people even go so far as to say, well, the God of the Old Testament, that's just people given their ideas of God, and they just got it wrong. That's not who God is, and so they just, you know, cast it aside wholesale. But you might not do that, but what the typical Christian does is they just ignore those passages. They don't bring them up in Bible study. They don't talk about them. They don't discuss them. They, don't, when they, they just pretend like they don't exist, seemingly ashamed of what God is revealing in those passages of Holy Scripture. But if you have to look those things in the face, that hostility can rear its ugly, ugly head. Or some, some people might have no, or about sovereignty, God's holiness, or also they're offended by God's sovereignty. You know, we have, the, Ryan talked about this last week, about how we have an idea in our mind of how things ought to go. And when things are not going that way, we get frustrated with God. God, why is it going this way? I have other ideas. I have better ideas. This is not how it's supposed to be. And we get impatient. And we get angry. We get hostile with God. So some people, though, have no problem with God's sovereignty or his holiness. But they fight, and people of another sort, fight against the mercy of God. Now, how do you fight against the mercy of God? How are you hostile towards the mercy of God? If you're trying to buy your way to heaven... You know, like the old Led Zeppelin song, you know, buying a stairway to heaven. If, if we wouldn't necessarily say that. We wouldn't say, you know what I'm doing? How am I living life? I'm doing good works, so I'm buying my place in heaven. People don't say that, but our actions betray us. Because we're not receiving God's mercy, we want to earn our way, earn favor with God on our own steam and in our own flesh. And how it shows up would be like this. Imagine someone you know, just blows it. They, they do something that uh, really is hurtful to another person in their life. And it's, it's bad. They recognize, ah, I'm, I, I did this. It's bad. How do you react to that? Well, what often happens is that people, you, you might spend the next four to five to seven days consumed with that. 
you can almost think of nothing else. You get up in the morning, you go, ah, and you're trying to, you're hyper vigilant of being on your very best behavior. Your very best behavior. You don't feel normal. Oh, you can, you're consumed with this until enough time goes by and you feel like you've rebuilt your moral goodness. You've been on good behavior now for about seven days and only then do you begin to feel normal rather than receiving the mercy of God because mercy is undeserved. Mercy is receiving that which we, did, we, we, we deserved was wrath, but what we got was grace, okay? We fight against the mercy of God. People who struggle with that tend to be overly harsh with others because they're harsh on themselves. So, still not convinced that we have an issue with hostility towards God? Let me put it this way. The one tiny sliver of time in human history that God made himself killable, what did we do? We killed him. A tiny fraction of time in human history, God made himself killable, and humankind killed him. We killed him. And as Romans 8 states, we cannot get over this hostility on our own. Let's close in prayer. I'm joking. There's more. So how do we get over this? What's our hope? Only he is our peace. He is our peace. Only in the gospel are we rescued from this and brought to a place where we bow before his holiness and melt in the face of his mercy. Melt in the reality of his mercy. There's a quote by Timothy Keller that I heard about eight years ago and it just changed my life and it's this. In the gospel, you realize that you are more sinful than you ever dared believe, but you are more loved than you ever dared hope. The truth is that when we receive grace, which we need more than anything, we are at once humbled and undone by his love. We, Because uh, it's a very humbling thought to realize that I was in such bad shape that Nothing less than the death of the Son of God was required for me to even have a relationship with God. That's how bad I was. That's how hostile I was towards God in my heart. That's a very humbling prospect. But it's also, it, it wraps us in a love when we realize the, the reality of his love that God willingly did that. Lived the life that we should have lived and died the death we should have died. Suffered horribly. Uh, on the cross, both physically and spiritually. Why? So that he could restore what was broken. So he could make whole and complete that, sh that which had been fractured by our rebellion. That's the love that he did for us. And we were both humbled and were overwhelmed by his love. This, when we get that, it changes the way we approach God. Because if we think that the number one thing we need from God, or our number one issue, is ignorance. Meaning that, man, there's just some things I don't know. So I'll come to God for guidance and instruction and treat him as a teacher to help me add some things to my life so I can do things better. Okay? Or if I just go, you know what, my main issue is I'm just not motivated enough. I'm, I just, it's, it's feelings. My feelings are all messed up. And so I need to come to God and have him deal with my apathy or my bad feelings. I need better motivation from God. And I'm going to come to him to just make, have him make me feel better. But if I recognize that my biggest issue with God is hostility with God, I will come to him for grace. I will come to him for peace and reconciliation. And when I, the, the, another way of saying that is this. Our hearts will only be transformed by his grace when we realize that it is grace that we need most of all. And think about it this way. If you, what, what gets in the way, what, what causes uh, um, a lack of shalom in your life, just practically speaking, okay? It's going to be a couple of different things. It's going to be a lack of humility. If you don't have humility you're going to have a whole lot of conflict in your life. If you're not walking in humility, then everything's going to be a power play, either passive-aggressively or aggressively. You're going to constantly uh, see yourself as better than others, superior to others, and you're going to be, everything, everything's a power play. 
I need to gain power over the situation. I need to control this situation. I need to get the bad people out and the good people in according to my design, and then everything will be right. Now, think about that. How, how, um, how much of a superiority complex do I have to have if I see someone talking on TV and I go, you know what, life would be better if you just weren't around. That's a pretty superior uh, attitude to have. But as Shekinah often says, we're all the same size at the cross. When I'm humbled by my own sin and my need for Jesus, my need for grace, I'm not going to look down on anybody. Now, I can discern between right and wrong, evil and righteousness. I can do that, but I don't look down on anybody. And so there's no more power plays, no more quarrels, no more uh, 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 power struggles that lead to all kinds of dissensions and problems in our life because humility and the grace that comes with our humility. Also, when we're made secure in his love, it works, uh, God begins to work in our heart in extinguishing feelings of inferiority and insecurity and anxiety. How much uh, uh, broken shalom comes because of that? Because we just feel inferior. We feel insecure. And we're riddled with anxiety. Now, there's two types of anxiety. There's a medical anxiety that has nothing to do with sin, and there's an anxiety that has to do with us allowing our concern to turn into, uh, get steroids and turn into worry. And we are, our, our, our anxiety, we're riddled with anxiety, riddled with worry, and we have no peace. But when we're enveloped in the reality and this, of his love and the strength of his love, that begins to wash away. And now, I don't, I can, I can have peace in my heart that I can give away. So that's the first thing. The second, uh, the third, second, third, and fourth would be much quicker than the first one there. But secondly, uh, we, <clears throat> we realize that this peace is absolute and perfect. Okay? Absolute and perfect. Because, G- because Jesus is our peace, we have something solid, something absolute that no one can take away from you cannot be moved or altered because in Christ, think about it this way, the pe- what does it mean that Jesus is our peace? In Christ, you will never be more lovely or more holy in God's sight than you are right now. That's what 2 Corinthians 5.21 is all about, that he, had, God made him who had no sin to become sin for us, that we might become better in God, no, become the righteousness of God. Think about that. God, the Father, looks at you and he sees you as being as righteous as as Jesus because he is our substitute. He is our intercessor. He is our atonement. And so when God looks at you, you are covered in his righteousness. That doesn't mean that we don't grow in righteousness and better behavior and all of that. And all that matters and is an important part of our walk with the Lord. But the reality is that God, you can, he will not see you more lovely or more holy than you are right now in Christ. No one can take that from you. And as we rest in that, it transforms the way that we look at everything. It's not your moral goodness. It's not your circumstances that are your peace. Jesus is your peace. Not, your, um, not, not what's on the news today. That's not your peace. Hallelujah. It's Jesus who is your peace. Peace, and we have this secure, uh, held for us in uh, in Christ, a future shalom where everything, everything, all the stuff that is now ephemeral will be forever in heaven when Christ in His second advent comes and we see Him as He is, and we become like Him. That means no more power struggles, no more of that junk. That's our future. That's what we get to hope in and rest in. Third, we pursue peace of all other kinds, but those other pieces, those other other types of peace, (laughs) uh, must flow out of the absolute peace we have in Christ. So it's appropriate to pursue relational peace, cultural peace, financial peace, national peace, all those things we should pursue. You don't ignore that. You pursue it, but we must, it must flow out of this. To put it this way, if you, if you don't do it that way, your peace will always evaporate. If you don't have peace now, it's because you are pursuing peace rather than receiving peace. Big difference. Uh, we must receive peace and then pursue it. Or, or, we must receive peace and then give it away. If I'm trying to 
accomplish peace, then it'll elude me. Fourth, two questions on this fourth one. First, have you received peace? Have you received it? If not, receive it today. Receive it today. Second question, are you operating out of the resources of this peace? So maybe you've received peace, but you're currently not operating out of the resources of that peace. You're having trouble forgiving. You're having trouble worrying, trouble with anger, trouble with hopelessness, trouble just being bored. If that is happening in your life, then that means you are not living out of the resources you have in Christ. Or to put it another way, you've moved on from the gospel. A very common temptation To say, okay, the gospel's great. Yes, thank you. Now I'm going to go and move on to other things. And what are the other things? Usually ways of us trying to procure our own peace. This is what's interesting to me. I want to do this, this, and this, and this. But we've moved on from the gospel. If in your mind, if the gospel is um, just old news to you, instead of mind-boggling good news, you won't have peace. Peace will elude you, and you will not dwell Secure. Have the worship team come on up. We're going to close with a simple question. Again, do you have peace today? As we sing, we're going to sing Hark the Herald Angels.